I'd like now to hand over to Matthew Tillett, Lead Portfolio Manager of the Brunner Investment Trust. Over to you, Matthew. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, a pleasure to be here today. Um, thank you to Chair Sock um, for uh, inviting me to, to present today and to talk about the Brunner Investment Trust. I've got a uh, slide deck here, uh, which I'll sort of whiz through fairly quickly um, to leave a good time for um, questions um, at the end. And just sort of by, by way of um, introduction, um, oops, there we go. Yeah, just by way of introduction, just uh, sort of a few sort of headline facts uh, about, about the trust. Um, so Brunner is a uh, circa 520 million gross assets uh, investment trust. Um, listed on the London Stock Exchange, ticker is BUT. Uh, it's been around since um, well, almost 100 years, uh, since the 1920s. A reason why it's called Brunner is because uh, it was founded by uh, the Brunner family um, back in, in, well, in the 1920s um, uh, with, with the proceeds from a sale of, of their business, um, with the, the idea being to um, create a sort of long-term vehicle for um, you know, wealth, wealth preservation and, 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 and growth uh, as well. Uh, the, the family are still big shareholders um, uh, around sort of 20, 25% or so, but they're not running the trust. Uh, they have one representative on the board, but the board itself is an in, a fully independent board. Um, and, the, and, and I work for Allianz Global Investors, who uh, we, you know, we've been appointed by the board um, to manage the, uh, the, the investment portfolio um, of, of the trust. Uh, investment strategy, uh, diversify portfolio uh, of equities, um, seeking to deliver both capital growth, um, so outperformance of our, our benchmark um, over the long term, uh, but also um, an attractive yield, um, which we define as in line with the benchmark um, at the moment, that's around 2% two, two or so, um, but, but also yield that grows nicely over time um, so that shareholders have you know, have that um, you know that that kind of growth and income and, and, and you know, protection from from inflation. Uh, circa sixty to seventy holdings, uh, mostly global, um, but we do still have a uh, have a you know a, a sizable allocation um, to the UK as well, uh, about about twenty twenty five percent or so. Uh, very much a long term oriented um, investment approach here, and that's true at both the both trust level itself. Uh, so boards always had a quite a conservative uh, approach to, um, to life. Um, so pretty sort of conservative gearing policy. You know, we have a little bit of gearing, but it's not, not that much. It's never going to cause us any problems. Uh, so balance sheets are pretty conservatively managed, uh, but also a, a long term approach uh, from, from an investment perspective. Um, so myself and my colleagues are very much taking a long time horizon, um, five to 10 years or so. Um, it, when we're thinking about the underlying investments, very fundamentally driven, um, often sort of looking for, you know, sort of try to take advantage of the stock market's short-term behaviour in order to, in order to you know, buy you know, really attractive um, for long-term investment cases. And it's quite 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 a few examples of that um, later on, which Charlotte I'll, I'll get into. Um, just in talking about long-term. Um, here's very much an example of, of the long-term oriented approach. Um, uh, we, the trust has, has raised its dividends 49 years in a row, uh, and, and that growth is significantly ahead of inflation as well um, uh, over that period. Uh, it, it, the other point just to bring out here is that you can see from that chart on the right uh, how familiar, um, uh, so some people may be more familiar than others with the investment trust structure, but one of the advantages of the investment trust structure as opposed to an open-ended um, fund structure is you can use uh, reserves, the board can use reserves um, to, uh, to sort of help that kind of progression of, of, of income uh, growth over time. So in the good years, um, those green bars, uh, when some of the, the, the earnings, revenue earnings that the trust has generated, we haven't paid out in dividends and we put them into reserves. And then in the tougher years, um, uh, like for example, last year, um, we were able to draw on those those reserves in order to um, to keep that progression um, of, of different growth going. And we, we've got a strong reserve position as well. We, we, we've got over uh, over a year's worth of dividend um, in, in reserves, and that's even after last year. Uh, so it's a pretty a pretty healthy position there. Um, 
next couple of slides uh, just uh, cover the actual performance uh, from a capital perspective. So this is the NAV uh, and the share price, um, just as what, what the shareholders see, um, you see kind of pretty consistent um, performance there versus the benchmark, uh, similar picture at the portfolio level as well. Um, fairly kind of consistent, um, steady uh, outperformance of the benchmark. And the next few slides, uh, I'm just gonna focus on our actual investment philosophy, um, the process, a little bit about the team. Um, uh, so you can sort of get a better understanding of kind of how, how we're operating, um, how, how we think. Um, this is this is the philosophy that we're we're following when we're looking at companies to invest in and how we analyze those companies. Uh, we're really looking at three things. And when we're looking at growth. Um, what we're interested in here is the uh, longer term uh, growth drivers. Uh, so structural or secular trends, um, shifts in in the economy and society uh, that are impacting uh, industries and business models. Um, and, and so much more kind of yes yeah, or sort of longer term rather than the kind of cyclical um, or shorter term stuff that, that that you see that we see happen and that often gets a lot of focus. Um, for us, it's the longer term stuff that's a more important um, driver. Uh, we want to make sure that the companies we're investing in, in are, you know, really the right side of, uh, of those sorts of trends. Um, there's then the, the quality piece, which is actually it, it, of these three, it's, that's the most important. It's, it's certainly, um, you know, it's, it's, it's more important than growth um, because, because we want to make sure that we're owning companies that can actually capture that growth. And what I mean by that is um, business models that are able over time to not only, not only grow their revenues, but also grow their, you know, grow, grow their profits, grow their cash flows, uh, and ultimately in time, you know, grow their distributions to us as shareholders. Uh, and you, what you find if you look back through, through um, uh, 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 sort of stock market or economic history is that you, there's lots of examples of industries that, that have delivered lots and lots of asset growth and revenue growth, but um, often haven't really come through for shareholders. Um, and that's just because of the competitive nature um, of of, of capitalism and, and that you know, those industries that have all the growth tend to attract a lot of competition. Um, so we're very focused on finding those business models in, in industries um, that can, in, you know, in some way or another, be able to, um, you know, be less impacted by that competition. Uh, they've got um, you know, barriers protecting their their business models. Um, that means that they can they can sustain those returns over, over the long term. Um, and then the final piece is the valuation piece, uh, which is very important um, uh, because ultimately, you know, the price that you pay for something, um, you know, is, is always going to be uh, a you know, very important factor in determining the, the return that you you make over over the long term. Um, however, we're not sort of we're not, we're, we're the, the way we look at valuations. We're, we're not so much looking at the kind of sort of cheap for cheap sake. Uh, what, what we're trying to do is you know, calibrate those quality and growth um, factors, and incorporate them into the valuation, uh, often looking kind of five, 10 years out uh, using DCFs uh, or reverse DCFs to try to ascertain what the stock market is implying and, uh, and, and then how that may differ to what, to what our view is and uh, making decisions accordingly. Uh, really, it's the most important thing is making sure one doesn't overpay. Um, you know, buying good assets at fair or cheap prices um, is a is a, a quite, a quite a proven um, strategy over the long term. And this is this slide in, in here just it, it, it illustrates um, in the context of the industry life cycle the kind of focus area for us. Uh, now anybody who's done a, a business or economics degree would have seen that some variation of this chart at some point, which which is a sort of stylized example really of a of a typical. Um, industry that goes through a uh, you know sometimes over the course of several decades will you know will go through a very very sort of rapid growth period to begin with where um, you know there's a new market that's emerged and it's not quite clear so how exactly the the industry structure is going to um, going to settle there's lots of different business models um, competing um, you know, huge huge upside potential but also a lot of uncertainty I um, mean you then get typically get a more uh, stable period where where it's 
the industry's established itself, it's clear who the winners are going to be, um, uh, and that that and, and and they they tend to you know stay you know, do do well from there over several years, decades even before the industry then starts to mature out. Um, you know when it when the, the markets have become saturated. Uh, and then eventually, you know, to, you know, drifts into decline, um, and the whole process starts again. Um, you know, you know, maybe disruptive forces come along and um, you know, put put the you know the, the older business the older um, businesses um, uh, into trouble, and eventually, you know, they they go out of business themselves. Um, now, what our focus area is very much in that kind of central ground there, where that you know the the red. Um, uh, circle is and the reason why we focus on that that kind of that that bit in the middle um is a couple of reasons um firstly it's because it's what we're good at uh you know we we as analysts um are good at analyzing companies that have some kind of you know, they're basically established businesses you know where they have a track record uh they're already profitable we can get our heads around the industry structure uh, and we therefore have the confidence to be able to project forward you know, far enough um, that we can make those kind of long-term investment decisions. Um, in contrast, we find it, it, it is, in our experience, it was, it's much harder doing that in those two extreme, the, the, the two side um, segments. So the very early growth businesses where they're not, profitability isn't yet, yet established, kind of much harder to, to know exactly what, how, that, how that's going to play out. It doesn't mean you can't do well investing there. There are lots of Investors who do do well there, um, they specialise in it. It's just not not what we do. A, a similarly, at the other end of the spectrum, you know, when you've got kind of restructuring situations and turnarounds and that sort of thing, again, it's a bit more of a specialist area, and it's not really what we're doing here. Um, the other reason why we focus on this this core group is because we want the portfolio to have a consistency to it. We want we want the holdings in the portfolio to all as far as possible to, to, to be making a contribution to both of those objectives, but both the capital growth and the income. Uh, and we find it easier to find those kind of companies in this, in this group, you know, where you've got typically very, very uh, profitable cash generative businesses, um, that therefore, you know, are able to pay dividends as well. And that means we can have a, a sort of consistent portfolio without kind of extremes at, at, um, at, at either end. I just very quickly on the resources that this is this is who's um, you know who's managing the, the, the portfolio um, as my, my team and, and the resources that we have around us. Two points to bring out here. Uh, firstly, the, the three of us, the the the, the three that people you see there, myself, my two colleagues, Christian, Marcus, um, we're the portfolio managers responsible for the portfolio. Um, we're, we're all experienced portfolio managers in our own right. Um, and we have kind of run money for. For many years but importantly we also have specialist um, expertise as well which is important for for, for this this trust um because of that um more balanced mandate where we're looking for both income and growth um you know we you know, myself my, my background's you know a little bit more on the income investing side um and also on the uk as well i've got quite a lot of experience from the uk um uh, in investing so i'm sort of bringing that piece to the table uh, whereas Christian Marcus are much more, um, uh, you know, growth-oriented investors, um, and so therefore they bring that um, the expertise in that that area to the, to the table. But we're all taking ownership of the portfolio. The three of us, we're not we're not segmenting, um, you know, into different parts. Uh, but we're just you know bringing that that specialist knowledge to the, to to um, you know to to the table to the discussion. Um, and also the second point is that it's not just the three of us. Um, in fact, really isn't. It's really the important bit is what's around us, um, the global resources that, that we have. Um, yeah, particularly the portfolio management teams uh, and the, you know, the, the fundamental company research and most of the ideas in, in the portfolio, um, the holdings and the new ideas that are coming through are coming from actually some of our colleagues around the world. Um, and, you know, we're you know, we're taking those ideas and, and, and putting them into the portfolio um, you know, when, when it's appropriate to do so. I just quickly on the process, um, this is this is basically explains sort of how, uh, you know, an idea um, you know, gets gets into the portfolio and exits the portfolio. Uh, idea generation, um, to be honest, you know, we get tons of you know, tons and tons of ideas. Um, you know, we, we've got so, so many colleagues around the world, um, so internal internal resources and also external resources as well. 
um, what, what our job really is to is to filter down um, those ideas to the ones that are most relevant for what we're looking for um, uh, for, for runner. The stock selection uh, is where you know, that's where the, the important stuff is done. You know, that's where the due diligence uh, you know, is conducted and, and um, the, the substantial sort of fundamental research that goes on in order to ascertain whether you know, an investment case um, you know, really stacks up in terms of what, um, you know, what, what we're looking for. And we do that through those, those three lenses, the, the quality growth um, valuation. And portfolio construction, uh, this is obviously a fully invested um, portfolio, um, relatively low gearing. Uh, we are running uh, you know, typically uh, kind of 60 to 70 stocks. Um, uh, that's where we've, where we've been over the last sort of two or three years. Um, and position sizing, uh, we, we tend to sort of, we, we sort of build positions based on um, levels of conviction um, liquidity uh, and also income as well, and we have a we have a sort of one two four uh, percent um, sort of kind of rough approach. We don't we don't sort of stick religiously to it, but we have sort of rough targets of 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 what we want the position sizes to be. So two percent position size is a sort of standard position size for us. So, you know, high conviction position that is also making a contribution to the income objective as well. Um, you know, four percent holdings. You have those exceptional opportunities, typically highly liquid, um, sort of large cap companies as well. Uh, and then one percent holdings are you know, they're, they're for gen they're generally for the smaller or mid cap holdings. So we are we do have some uh, we are sort of active in that end of the market, and we want to be able to um, you know take advantage of those ideas when they come through. But we, we because of the liquidity, we you know we'll keep those positions smaller. And also for holdings that and make no contribution to the income as well you know when we have very good good ideas coming through that don't pay them we want to be able to consider them here and and, and, and own them um, from time to time but again we keep that position sizes small so that we're not we're not constraining the portfolio or, or having to stretch for income um, elsewhere because we, we don't want to don't want to have to be doing that um, and sell discipline uh, and so valuation, so it's valuation driven, so we will respond, you know, as, as valuations move, um, tend to be quite gradual um, if an investment case is working. Um, you know, most of our companies have you know, got some growth anyway, so, you know, intrinsic value will be growing over time. Um, so we tend to be more, more gradual um, there. If a change of investment case, uh, if something's, you know, typically a deterioration, and new, something new emerges that, you um, you know, has, has, has sort of undermined the investment case will we'll quite often be a bit more rapid. Um, we may, you know, exit positions quite quickly. Uh, better opportunities often sometimes within a, within a sector or within, within a similar area, we may uh, have, a, you know, have, a, have a better idea um, that we, we that just, you know, stacks up better on paper and therefore we'll, we'll, make, we'll make a change. Uh, so that's the, that's the process. Uh, portfolio, um, just, just here, uh, uh, you can see the top 20 holdings. I'm not going to mention any individual companies, but I'm um, kind of obviously very happy to uh, to take any questions that anyone may have. You can see that the sector weightings uh, are I, I, I kind of as, as one would expect, uh, given our, that focus that we have on, um, particularly on the bias towards quality, uh, you know, we tend to find it easier to find uh, the kinds of business models that we want to invest in in the, those kind of sectors so healthcare in particular which is our, our biggest sector uh, from an absolute relative perspective and i'll talk a bit more about that in a minute or two's time um but also um industrials uh within financials as well but financials particularly the kind of more asset light financials um so sort of payments company asset managers annual asset gatherers um and, and um you know, platform businesses uh, and, and the technology sector as well um, is obviously another you know, another industry where, where you can find those kind of companies. We're not zero weighted elsewhere. However, you know we do look at the, some more capital intensive industries, and we do have some holdings there. But we, you know, the, the, yeah, the hurdle was a bit higher, um, and we tend to be sort of very focused. We're quite you know pretty selective um, in, in that that end of the market. Uh, and then from a size perspective, you can see this is predominantly a a, a large cap. So highly liquid portfolio. Um, however, we we do um, you know, you know, we do have some exposure to to the mid and small caps as well, and that's particularly in the UK, um, uh, where we just found with the UK allocation, um, the, the 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 just 
looking for sort of quality and growth and value valuation as well. Uh, there's just much better opportunities amongst the mid caps um, in the UK, and and whereas the large com- the large companies that you know, there's, there's, I'm sure many on, people on the call will, will know that you know this it has a bit of a growth problem um, in the UK stock market. So that's kind of you know why 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 you see that um, that waiting there. And um, that's been been good for us over, over time as well. Uh, just transactions here. This is in the 12 months. Um, again, I won't I won't mention every single one. I'll just try and sort of draw out um, some examples to sort of illustrate you know how how we operate and. Um, and and what you can expect from us. Uh, I, so a couple of things to I sort of draw, draw here. That, I mean, generally, what you find with us is that we tend to be so we're quite, we're, we're very long term in the way we think about our investment cases. Uh, generally, you know, taking a longer term view than the most investors and certainly the, you know the stock market does most of the time. Uh, but in the short term, we'll quite often be contrarian um, and we'll quite often be actually taking advantage of of some some pressure in the market or or some focus on a on a particular issue that that we think is just temporary in nature but is creating a, you know a, a, an opportunity for us to to buy a great franchise at, a, at an attractive price um and one example of that which i'll just draw out which has been a really good contributor for us actually over the last 12 months is novo nordisk um, which is a, a pharmaceutical company and the world leader in diabetes prevention and treatment uh, and we bought that around actually around 12 months ago um which if you recall was around the time when the when uh, there was a lot of excitement towards cyclical companies we had some you know the vaccine announcements had come in better than everyone expected um uh, and there'd been a lot of rotation in the market uh away from uh, it's all kind of somewhat clear away from the, the healthcare sector which you know was kind of where a lot of the, you know most of the, all the vaccines came from um but obviously not a cyclical industry uh and so generally kind of not not really you know, not really in vogue at that point in time and we've seen some quite quite sharp d ratings um valuation d ratings in this company in particular um, which is a, it has been a very strong performer over a very long period of time uh, we saw no reason why that wasn't going to carry on, uh, and it had come back to uh, kind of sort of mid-high teens um, earnings multiple, uh, which is you know, towards the low end of where it's historically traded, and, and in absolute terms, is, is, is not a high valuation for um, the, the company. Um, this company, which has you know, delivered you know, pretty pretty strong earnings growth uh, over the long term, um, and that's continued this year. They've had a good year. They've um, released some. Uh, some of their new drugs uh, got kind of new new um, ways of delivering uh, some of the treatments, um, which are improving patient outcomes, and they've they've done very well. Uh, and it's you know it's it's uh, re-rated considerably as well. Um, so that's the sort of the the, the sort of thing you can um, could expect from us in the short term. We sort of, you know, so we sort of tend to be leaning against the um, you know the, the the prevailing wind, but all the while sort of running a a, a kind of balanced balanced portfolio. Um, the other another example would be uh, sort of just kind of upping the quality in the portfolio as well. Um, we're, we're, we're kind of always quite conscious. Um, sometimes you know use maybe shift on existing investments. There's maybe better opportunities within within an existing sector. And a more recent example of that would be in the UK where we we've, um, we've actually sold out Lloyd's. Um, uh, it's, you know, it's had a a decent rally recently uh, on on the back of sort of rising interest rate um, expectations, um, and we bought uh, Paragon Bank um, instead, which is a specialist bank um, in the UK, uh, and they they specialise in in um, lending to professional buy to let landlords. Now the next um, few slides, which I'll I'll, I'll be doing in the last sort of five minutes or so, um, it just try to bring to life uh, some of the themes within the portfolio, some of the that sort of structural stuff that that I mentioned at the beginning, um, and and how how that's kind of manifesting itself in the portfolio. Uh, this slide here on the digital economy um, is, yeah, I mean, digitalization clearly a massive theme. Uh, you know, it's been you know, affecting all of our lives for you know, the last 20, 25 years and will continue to affect our lives the next 20, 25 years. But the interesting thing and what we're trying to what we're trying to bring to life here and what you see in the portfolio is for us, it's about a lot more than the technology sector. Um, that's really what we're saying here. You know, yes, the tech sector will continue to be an important part of that and will. Will you know there'll be you know 
lots of opportunities there. But the real interesting story over the next 10, 15 years is going to be how these technologies start to impact. Well, they already are impacting, but they're going to carry on impacting other industries, uh, creating opportunities for, you know, for winners, but also losers as well. Uh, being the right side of that um, is going to be really important. Um, so, for example, in the financial sector, you see it you know, a lot there with um, sort of payments companies um, you know, benefiting a lot from, from um, you know, digital technologies and also uh, you know, some of the platforms and the investment platforms, um, companies like Schwab, IG in the UK that, that um, are able to use digital technologies uh, to uh, you know, to improve the, the service that they provide to their customers and attract more customers onto their platforms and, and, and in the process of doing that, you know, lowering trading costs and, and, and improving liquidity. Uh, those sorts of trends are going to carry on and um, the companies that are well placed for it um, should, do, should do very well. Similarly, within the consumer sector, what we're seeing there, um, and this has actually been accentuated during the pandemic, um, is some of these brands... Um, are companies like Adidas, for example, are, are increasingly able to sort of communicate directly with their with their customers, um, whereas previously they would you know, have to rely more on you know, bricks and mortar retail um, or, or other ways of, of um, reaching their customers and, and selling more directly online. And again, you know, those companies that are well invested for that and have put resources behind it are likely to reap the benefits of it um, over the next five to ten years. Uh, Demographics, uh, another really important trend. Um, this is, uh, you know, I, I mean, you know, basically, you know, aging populations is something that is you know, happening pretty much everywhere around the world. Uh, you can see that in, in, in these, these projections here. Uh, it's, it, it, on the one hand, it, it's, if you take a sector like the healthcare, um, it, it creates an environment where you've got a greater, um, you know, willingness to, you know, to, to, to pay for these products and to, to, to demand um, your healthcare products and services, but it's also about um, economies getting richer as well, because it's not just, you don't just, you, know, you need the money to be able to pay for, for these um, products and services. And you tend to see that as well, that the you know, healthcare takes a bigger share of, of wallet over time as, as these, two, you know, these two trends are, are at play. Um, and it's really difficult to see how that isn't going to happen because it's kind of, it's kind of sort of baked into the numbers really. Uh, important also to, in, to, to emphasize though, that we, we also like the sector, um, and I mentioned you know, this, is, this is our biggest sector, both um, absolute and, and in relative terms. Uh, it's partly that growth pitch, but it's also because of the quality characteristics of, of the healthcare sector. Um, because it's, a, on the one hand, typically quite a highly regulated industry, um, uh, you, you find that generally like highly regulated industries are, are, are quite... Um, yeah, they're, 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 they have a tendency to produce uh, highly profitable companies um, that are difficult to displace, difficult to compete with because the regulation erects barriers to entry and it, be, yeah, it becomes difficult to navigate and harder for new companies to, to, um, to, 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 to enter and disrupt. Um, also, the other thing about the, this, the, the healthcare industry, and this is true across most of these sub-segments, particularly things like di um, uh, diagnostics, um, devices, Pharma, pharmaceuticals is the significant amounts of upfront R and D uh, uh, requirements um, that are needed for the for the leading firms to to maintain their positions. Um, uh, you know, if you sort of you know Novo Nordisk in diabetes or Roche in oncology, uh, you know these companies they they tend to you know, they're investing billions and billions um, to maintain their positions. Uh, again, very hard for for um, for uh, new competitors to um, to dislodge. So as long as you're in the right areas and, and the right therapeutic areas that are improving patient outcomes, um, uh, and they're therefore likely to continue to be able to um, command that share of wallet, um, you can do pretty well in this industry. Uh, outside, apart from the tech sector, it's been, um, I think, the number two sector in terms of earnings growth that's delivered uh, over the last, so since the financial crisis. Uh, and interestingly, the valuations are not um, they're not, they're, they, you know, I mean, there's a big range actually. You know, there are there are some, some, you know, very highly valued, um, high growth companies, but there's also, you know, you know more, you know, um, much more uh, lower valued companies, more mature businesses, but but also still have those that the kind of quality characteristics um, that, we, that we look for. 
Uh, and then the final one is, is just um, it's quite just the energy transition. Um, uh, again, kind of very much um, a, a, a trend that um, very hard to see how, um, you know, particularly with the sort of momentum that we've seen uh, pick up over the last few years and, and you know, gain pace with, with COP26, how, hard to see how this isn't going to happen. You know, that, 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 you know, this transition, um, there's, a, there's so much kind of uh, uh, political and economic and indeed technological um, uh, forces you know, pushing in this direction now. Uh, so, you know, what, what does that mean from, from an investment perspective? Uh, well, uh, we think that the, in, that, that, well, the interesting thing about it is that, you know, unlike, say, the digital economy, what's different here is that this is very much a kind of capital intensive um, uh, uh, project. Uh, the transition is going to be capital intensive because of what we're talking about is replacing huge amounts of, of, um, of, of capital infrastructure with new capital infrastructure. Uh, and that's going to involve, uh, well, firstly, it's going to take a long time um, because, because capital intensive things always take a long time to do um, because you, the capital has to be financed, funded, it has to be built. Uh, and, 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 you know, just by the physical nature of it, um, it's good. it means it will take quite a long time. Um, but the other, the second thing is that it's just the sheer amount of uh, money and, and, and capex um, that's going to have to be spent in order to make this happen. And we're talking about, you know, trillions and trillions of dollars um, over many years and decades um, in, in um, sort of new you know, sources of power generation and electrical grids. Uh, around the world, um, and that's going to create opportunities for, uh, it, it, you know, it, it, there, there will be for sure opportunities for new businesses and disruptive businesses. But I don't think it's going to be. My view is it, it's not going to be like the, uh, the digital economy where it sort of suddenly you get whole industries that are disrupted overnight. I think there's also going to be a lot of opportunities for for incumbent businesses um, as long as they're the right side of it and they've made investments in the right areas like if they're resource companies but also particularly industrial companies um, who are who are supplying the products um, you know, in, into this industry that are the, you know the um, you know, particularly for example a company like Schneider Electric which is which in their business is, is you know, basically um, electrical products mid and low voltage electrical products uh, so that's that's energy transition and then just finish off uh, very quickly on outlook um, uh, I mean we uh, clearly sort of a lot of uncertainty out there at the moment um, you know it was looking you know, the, the things were looking much better earlier in the year and then you know we've had uh, some issues come through more recently with uh, the, the problems with supply chains and difficulties of getting goods um, delivered uh, and inflationary pressures starting to appear um, uh, into into the, the system uh, clearly uh, improving a lot more a lot uh, less transitory than um, some of the central bankers would like us to believe um, I think you know I would my message would be you know I think well what we're doing is very much sticking on to our knitting you know we're we're remaining focused primarily on those longer term drivers and not taking you know too much of a view on you know, what may or may not happen in the next six to 12 months. I think when we look at some of those risk factors, uh, the two big ones being you know, inflation within the economy. Um, personally, I'm not too concerned about it for our portfolio um, because I think most of the companies that we're owning, uh, they're, they're pretty, you know, they've got pretty sound business models. Uh, yeah, most of them have good pricing power uh, and you know, they're the kinds of companies that, you know, I'm not saying, they're not going to be impacted at all, but generally, I would expect them to be able to pass most of those costs on, um, you know, at least over time, uh, and and therefore, you know, as these things work themselves through, uh, you know, they, they 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 should kind of pull through okay. Um, the other risk that I think is out there is just within the financial markets and uh, some some of the you know, what we're seeing going on, kind of some of the speculative behaviour uh, in certain areas of the market, uh, particularly in the US. Uh, again, it's kind of that's mainly focused in in certain kind of, sort of hyper growth or kind of concept stocks uh, that have very large market caps now, but but not you know, they don't have the, they're not the kind of companies that we're investing in. They don't have the characteristics that we're looking for. Many of them are not really established businesses yet. 
Um, it's just kind of not, not what we focus on. So to the extent that, you know, that's a risk factor, what's going on there, if it reverses, I, it's not something that I'm, I'm particularly concerned about for, for um, Runner because we're not really, we're not really active um, in that, that end of the market. Uh, so um, that's 37 minutes, so I better leave it there. Um, and yeah, I uh, hope that was useful and um, look forward to the questions. Great, thank you very much, Matthew. That was uh, a lot of detail and uh, very, very interesting. We've got a few questions on the Q&A and I've got a few questions by email. I'll start with the ones on the Q&A. Um, please, can you give an example of a few UK shares that you hold? Your top 10 biggest holdings appear to be international companies. Yeah, sure. I think you did mention at the start that uh, you hold 60 to 70 global holdings, but 25% are UK. Yeah, so uh, that is right. Um, you don't see them in, in the top. Um, I don't think there's any that get uh, into the top um, top 20. Um, as a, one thing I mentioned is that yeah, we, we, quite a lot of the UK holdings are, are mid-caps because uh, we, we've found that to be an area where we just find it easier to kind of Get what we're looking for um and i said we tend to keep those positions smaller um just because of sort of liquidity uh, on that subject of discount there's a, a question regards the size of the trust discount and uh, if you could comment on that and and um yeah how you approach that yeah so um we uh if go back in time a bit so we we had a um, a bit of a, a a sort of issue that we needed to deal with um uh, there was a, a merger, um, Aviva bought um, a company called Friends Provident um, back in 2015. And, and Friends Provident had a lot of holdings in investment trusts, um, uh, and including in Brunner, a 20% holding in Brunner, but they had lots of other ones as well. And they, they Aviva was not a long-term holder of investment trusts. They kind of made that quite clear. Um, fairly early on, um, that created a bit of a problem for a number of investment trusts, including Brunner, um, because you know, there was basically a, uh, a, a seller in the market that everybody sort of knew was a seller, a big seller, and you all know what that happens. Uh, we all know what happens when you have that situation. Um, and that's why, if you look over that period since 2015, we have at times traded at very wide discounts. Um, now, the good news is, you know, we they are no longer a shareholder. Um, and we we have uh, uh, all of that position was um, was was sold over the last year or so. Most of it went to um, wealth managers, uh, smaller wealth managers, and a lot of it actually went to it went to um, the the, the you know, I mean investors, you know, including people that are listening to this call, like on on the on the platforms. So you know, um, Hargreaves, Lansdowne, and AJ Bell. Um, uh, so you, you, the, the discounts come in a bit as a result of that. Um, now we we have uh, you know, we, we spent quite a bit of time last year kind of looking at the trust and sort of how how we'd approached the marketing of the trust previously, and we sort of concluded that uh, you know we think we think we've got a you know a really great proposition here. You know, it's, it's delivered over the long term and it should have broad appeal. Um, but we needed to focus it a bit more on certain areas, so particularly the some of the smaller wealth managers who had maybe had a bit more flexibility didn't weren't as kind of concerned by you know the, the liquidity. Some of the larger um, wealth managers they need very liquid vehicles, uh, but also the you know the individual investor, you know the the you know the the the, um, you know, the investors on on the on the, the retail platforms. Because um, we think the proposition is 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 you know, very attractive, um, and I can see that. I mean, I'm a big shareholder myself. I think it's, you know, I think it's a, a great, um, you know, sort of core holding um, that uh, you know that, that 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 sort of delivers over the long term. Uh, so we're focusing more on those on those groups, uh, and over time, you know, we believe I believe you know that will lead to the discount um, the discount narrowing. Um, mm -hmm. I can't say exactly how long it will take. Um, you know, this, this discount in the world of investment trust is a bit of a, it's a bit of a sort of uh, mysterious thing that people can never quite quite explain it. Um, I, we, we don't have a discount policy. Uh, the board doesn't have a discount policy. They're, they're not in the market buying buying shares. You know, when they go when we go below a certain discount, um, I think the view is that 
we don't really have the liquidity yet to to be able to do that the, da the danger with doing that is that you end up you end up just sort of shrinking the size of the trust as you sort yeah. of buy the shares in um you know never say never you know it gets it does get discussed um but at the moment that's not you know that, that we don't have that policy in place Right, thank you. Uh, a question that's come in via email. How proactive are you at participating at AGMs, for example, in your um, investee companies? Uh, we very proactive. I mean, we, um, oh, have I just, I've just done something. Um, uh, we, um, just get rid of that. Yeah. Uh, so we, 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 the way we do this is, uh, so, so Allianz Global Investors, yeah, we, we do this kind of centrally. So we have a we have a um, you know a, a, a sustainability and governance team uh, about 29, 30 or so uh, professionals who look at you know, obviously governance and stewardship is a big part of that. And there's also you know, obviously you know um, sustainability and environmental issues as well that um, you know, the team looks at. Uh, we have our own. Um, our own guidelines on governance, which which we've written internally, um, which you know, basically what, what what we basically deem to be best practice in terms of in terms of governance. Um, so we're not we're not doing is is just doing what ISS says. Um, you know, we we see what IS, the ISS recommendations are, but we have our own um, our own guidelines, uh, and we vote against a lot of. Um, do you, do you publish how you vote? Uh, we, I believe, I believe Bronner does. I believe we, I, I actually, I don't, I, I, I'm not sure exactly, but in the annual report, there definitely is, there definitely is disclosure on this. I'm not sure exactly to how much detail it goes into. I'd have to check, but there is, there is disclosure on it. Um, and we, yeah, we certainly report it to the board, um, you know, so that the, the board sees it. Um, and, and you know, by the way, you know, we we vote against a lot of. I mean, we the UK actually, interestingly, the UK does does best, yeah, you know, on this. So in terms of whether we vote against the fewest proposals in the UK, um, uh, whereas the US, you know, we we vote against something like 60, 70 percent of the remuneration um, proposals in the US because they don't they don't meet the, the standards and, and by the way a lot of the time it's not actually about the quantum it's about the fact that there's no um or the the transparency isn't there um right. that's the, like, the main issue that we we have with it right thank you we've got another question on the board here um where do you generate most of your alpha or rather um the key difference to other global trusts um yeah yeah sure good question i mean i think it's the, so i think the key difference to the other trusts in the sector, um, there's a couple of things. So, I think we're, we're, we're so first of all, we have a dual, a dual objective. So, trying to outperform the benchmark, but we also have this, this income an income objective as well. So, uh, I, I, I'm not familiar with all the trusts in the global peer group, but I, I don't think many of them have have that. I think maybe one or two of them do, but a lot of them are, are much more sort of pure capital growth oriented. Um, and then, sort of partly, kind of leading on from that. Um, because of that, you know that uh, dual objective, we have a more balanced portfolio. Uh, so if you if you look at the portfolio and say run a kind of style analysis on it, what you'll see is that the, 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 we consistently are are overweight quality. So things like return on capital, um, sustainable growth, balance sheet strength. We're often you know one two standard deviations. You know it, it, positive on those those metrics value the value metrics and the growth metrics we tend it's a bit more of a mix to be honest you know sometimes we're a bit above sometimes we're a bit below uh and you can see that in the portfolio as well we've got a huge range of, of um you know of, of valuations across the portfolio um so it's more balanced in that sense um uh, in terms of sort of where we get the alpha from i mean we're it, we, again i don't want to sort of comment on what sort of what other other funds are doing but you know but but we're much it's much more about the stock selection for us so we're we if you are the risk in our portfolio is is sort of 50 60 percent stock specific risk and the the other stuff the kind of factor risk style is is much less um you know where some of the some of the more kind of um 
so say sort of more more growth oriented and, and also if you looked at the income sector you probably find some more much more value oriented um trust as well they would probably be more more influenced by how that particular style is doing um, yeah so that that's i'd say is the is the main kind of just actually the other thing is the uk so we we have we have our benchmark is a composite benchmark so i should have mentioned that so so we have we have a composite benchmark so it's seven it's 30 percent FTSE all share and 70 percent FTSE world x uk and um, that's right. that's what we're measured against okay um, uh, and again i think that's it's not i think there's maybe one or two left in the in the in the global peer group that still have uh still have i say still because there's been a trend away from that um but i think there's one or two that still have a have a have a composite benchmark um we used to be 50 50 and then we were 60 40 before that so we've been on we've also been on a trend away from the uk um and you know who knows one day maybe we will be a fully global portfolio as well but at the moment i think we're we're we're, we're, we're sort of kind of happy happy as we are and there's one final question that I'll ask you about, has the trust ever identified and achieved 10x or 100x on investment? Obviously, you've been going for a long time, and I guess we don't want to talk about the whole lifespan of, of the trust. But if you could talk to that point and, and, and let us know, perhaps in the, in, the, in the more recent history about the performance. Yeah, I mean, I mean a good example of, of that, I mean, Microsoft, is a good, which is the largest, largest holding in Australia. I mean, that was purchased... Um, in I believe in 2011, um, when it was basically a value stock. I mean, it was it was priced at about sort of 10, 12 times earnings. Um, margins were, were were lower than where they are now. There was this kind of sort of disruption, kind of cloud over, over the business as people were sort of you know speculating over whether the company really had a future, and you know you know was sort of might, you know, all the word processing going to go to Google, you know, in the cloud and that sort of thing, or how, and how would they manage the transition to the cloud? Um, and and actually, they, you know, they they were. I mean, we felt at the time. Uh, it's easier to say this in hindsight. I mean, it, you know, it wasn't as clear then as it is now. But but you know, they they still had a massively profitable business with you know a, a kind of huge sort of embedded customer base. You know, sticky revenues. Um, you know, if anyone was going to be well positioned to to manage that transition, um, you'd think they, you know, they they would be, and they and they, you know, they they have done it well. And they benefited from having good leadership, and you know, the, the CEO who who took over um, you know, several years ago now, you know, he he, you know, sort of turbocharged that that transition. Um, but you know, that's I mean, it's not been a hundred x, but it's you know, it's been a you know, probably two, I mean, I mean, twenty x, um, certainly if you include the dividends as well. Yeah, um, great. Listen, uh, thank you very, very much. We, we are sort of coming to, to the end of the session. So it's very interesting, very informative, um, Matthew. Um, yeah, that was very good. Thank you very much.